Welcome to MapCrow, the RPG art show. My name is Kyle, and today we're building better animated armors. We continue to observe the spookiest season of the year with another video of building better monsters, and I am really happy with how this one turned out. If you enjoy these episodes, please hit that like button and leave me a comment. What are the ideas that you have from these videos? And if you want to make sure you don't miss one, please hit that subscribe button as well. It really helps the channel out. And for access to the secret sketchbook that I am keeping with all of the concept sketches and visual reference that I'm using for these videos, head on over to patreon.com slash mapcrow and pledge for just five dollars a month. Animated armors are a mainstay of creepy castles and haunted houses. They can be transplanted into almost any kind of game that has a paranormal element in them. A suit of armor that is just like walking down a corridor at you is a wonderful visual and also an interesting challenge for players because there are no soft bits on the inside of the armor at which to aim. Now in the 5th edition of Dungeons & Dragons, these are basically set up in the monster manual to be essentially security robots for any of your dungeon locations. And another easy alternate explanation is that it is, you know, the spirit of the knight who used to wear the armor, or some restless spirits that live in the house and are kind of poltergeisting the armor around to fend off the interlopers. And these are both perfectly serviceable as explanations for why a suit of armor would be walking around and fighting off adventurers. But personally, I have fun reinventing the wheel in this series, so we are going to dig a little bit deeper and see if we can't be a tad more creative than that. I have always found a lot of visual inspiration and kind of just mythic immediacy through the tradition of Japanese woodblock printing. Now I have no expertise in this area, I just know that I find these images to be vibrant and inspirational for me as a fantasy illustrator. Some of the more eye-catching compositions I've run across are of kind of what would have been at the time common household items that are growing eyes and tongues and teeth and seem to be animating from some sort of malign will. And from my incomplete busted outsider understanding of these images, these animated objects are not being possessed or puppeted by some outside force, but instead are invigorated by the spirit that already inhabits that object. And already we have the ingredients for my favorite kind of encounter in a fantasy role-playing game. Because what we have is a point of view that is unlikely to belong to the player characters. As a GM, my favorite sentence to hear from one of my players is, I cast speak with animals. Because that means I get to extemporaneously come up with the priorities, the voice, the religion, the cosmological point of view of these animals. What do pigeons think of people? What do rats value from one another? What do spiders dream about? What do they aspire to become? I think this is one of the things that fantasy stories are positioned to do very, very well. They can set up every single thing in the cosmos to have a purpose and a dignity and an autonomy. And they can set up characters with a human point of view in direct conflict with those other kinds of worldviews. And that conflict doesn't always need to end in a reduction of one creature's hit points to zero. Oftentimes, if you're casting a spell like Speak with Animals, it means that you have the ability to reach consensus, to bargain, to find a way to integrate yourself into an empathetic relationship with this other point of view. And this is somewhat easier to do with living creatures than it is with inanimate objects, because living creatures kind of need a lot of the same things that we humans do. So the question becomes, what is the point of view of a walking suit of armor with a bunch of old swords stuck in it? What desire does it have for its future? What are its designs on people walking through its tombs? These are the questions that I find compelling as a GM and 
I just don't find in the monster manual. So after doing just a little bit of research, I found a wonderful article from 2009 by Noriko T. Ryder, an article called Animating Objects, Tsukumo Gami Ki and the Medieval Illustration of Shigan Truth. And I will have the article linked below, and I do apologize for any of those mispronunciations. A lot of this article went straight over my head as someone who is not fluent with the conversations of Japanese religious studies, but I did find this wonderful short poem that was translated that seems to be one of these animated objects speaking about its worldview. It reads, If this were but a world to which humans were quite foreign, then perhaps in spring our hearts would know peace. There seems to be a deep resentment towards humanity in these words, and humanity is what is responsible for these objects being made in the first place. And from the little bit of research I've done on the subject, it seems like some of the conditions for these objects gaining this voice, gaining this animating will, is when they have been disrespected, discarded, or allowed to live beyond their usefulness. And in the view of a silly fantasy game like Dungeons and Dragons, this kind of got me thinking about all of these items that uh, adventurers tend to collect and then just like leave at the bottom of the bag of holding. And what might all of those unused, unloved items, magic or otherwise, think when they see a suit of armor collecting weapons and liberating them from the bottoms of all these backpacks? Maybe they would mount some kind of revolt. Maybe your 50 feet of rope would suddenly uncoil and tangle up your legs. What if your woodworking tools suddenly started chiseling into your kneecaps? What if that deck of cards that you've had in your inventory since character creation suddenly flew out of your pockets when you were casting a spell to ruin your concentration? What I like about this encounter so much is, yes, you kind of just have a, a good, solid boilerplate combat encounter with a walking suit of armor that totally wants to pound you into a pulp and then liberate all of your stuff, but also it has the potential to weird your player's assumptions about the world and all of this stuff that they're just accumulate it. You know, maybe after this they just take all the stuff they're not using and sell it, or burn it in a bonfire. But maybe they start using that 50 feet of rope. Maybe they start finding ways to include all of their equipment into their gameplay. Or maybe they include it into their roleplay, where they look at their stuff that they're not using and they give it away to NPCs and they start investing into these relationships through gift giving. And it's kind of up to the DM how much they want this to affect the game and how often they want to bring this kind of stuff up. But it would be interesting if there was some kind of like temple to the crafting god that would tell you what to do and how to, you know, appease these disquieted spirits that have had this experience with one of these walking armor suits. I certainly think there is a way to run this kind of encounter and for this kind of idea to become too preachy to be fun and, and really kind of deliver the experience that everybody is there to play with a fantasy adventure game. Um, but I think just a, the right amount of spice with some thoughtfulness is going to make for a memorable encounter that will give your players new verbs, new ways to interact with the world that they wouldn't have had before thinking through the logical conclusions that the existence of an anime armor in this style would mean for how they interact with the game. In game design, if you want a certain style of play to happen, then you need to make sure that that style of play matters. And in Dungeons & Dragons, that oftentimes means making it matter for combat and making those combats mean things for the other pillars like exploration and roleplay. In any case, I think that will just about do it for this episode. Thank you so much for watching. We have one or two more episodes left for October, and I have some ideas for what I want to do with them, but I always appreciate suggestions. 
There's a bunch of standard spooky season monsters I really haven't had a chance to dig into, but I also want to make sure that I'm not doing anything too similar to what I've already done so far. Lots of folks keep suggesting gnolls and demons, and believe me, I'm reading those comments, but I also need to have like an idea that is different enough from what's already written down that it would warrant its own video. <laughs> I'm very worried that some of you folks feel like I'm ignoring you when in fact nothing could be further from the truth. I just really want to make sure that every episode I put out is meeting a certain standard of quality, that's all. So with those disclaimers out of the way, until next time, my friends, farewell.